You're listening to the Curiosity Collective podcast. I'm Arpita and I'm Deepika. You know Deepika on 16 Feb 2020 that now almost fairy tale period before the pandemic sort of officially came to India. I went for a birding walk being organized by Deepa Mohan to Madiwala Lake and you can hear Deepa chatting here with a bunch of kids while we're on the walk. And it's called the tail about you know why? It really sows the leaves together yeah, to make a nest. It does it does. And seriously, I think back on this period and it just feels surreal. Was it the lack of masks and all that hyper vigilance that we've all normalized now? I mean for sure. I just remember running out of the house and then leisurely looking about the lake, meeting and greeting a whole bunch of new people, pointing out birds, children asking all these questions. And it all happened. I mean, all of us elbow to elbow sharing binoculars and guides. To think that it's now 2022, I mean, that feels like it was from another carefree lifetime altogether. Absolutely. And but you know, it, what it made me realize was that that's how long we've been planning our chat with Deepa. I was absolutely adamant about talking to her, but because of the lockdowns, we finally managed to chat only last year. My name is Deepa Mohan. I have lived in Bangalore since 1988 with the little breaks and continuously since 1997. I've fallen in love with my state and my city. As somehow uh, I did not have that sense of belonging in Chennai where I lived or in Madurai. What she is not telling you there is that Deepa is one of the most well-known birder and naturalist guides in the city of Bangalore. She regularly organizes and leads walks uh, in and around the city and is probably teacher, mentor and inspiration to a whole bunch of young people who have deepened their interest in nature, birding and wildlife thanks to her walks. I suddenly got bitten by the wildlife and nature bug around 2005 2006 and ever since my life has changed direction uh, I decided to take up uh, wildlife and birding. So it's been a very uh, it's been a learning journey in many directions because uh, I I learned how to handle at least some parts of the computer I had to learn uh, for my blog I had to learn some HTML which was also tough I had to learn photography uh, then I had to learn about wildlife What makes it even more remarkable is that she was 52 when she first began this journey into the natural world 52 my god i mean that's truly inspiring because often we're feeling even in our 30s that maybe it's too late to start something new well not if you meet deepa cuz the zeal energy and knowledge she brings makes you feel like she must have been doing this all her life and even now in her 60s she's constantly learning and challenging herself she was sharing how she's been participating in several wildlife and birds surveys and sanctuaries across the country doing some rigorous sounding courses to continue enhancing her knowledge and experience and also planning to volunteer in wildlife sanctuaries in the northeast and i think that's just like one year in deepa's life i don't think i've done close to as much in 4 years but tell me how did she get bitten by this wildlife bug Well it all began with this trip to Bear Hills Wildlife Sanctuary which is near Bangalore. She went there with her family and ended up meeting Kalyan Verma, a well-known filmmaker and conservationist, and later with S Karthikeyan who she calls a guru and who is currently the head naturalist at Jungle Lodges Resorts. So from courses to moving on to attending lots of walks, her learning curve seems to have taken on its own life from there. so i will always be grateful for to kartik i keep telling him you opened my eyes and you opened my ears and of course he says i hope you i have also shut your mouth while life you must keep your mouth shut your eyes and ears should be open because the less noise you make the more you can observe and listen those days it was a very small much smaller community of wildlife enthusiasts and uh, it was a combination of both wildlife interests and the burgeoning of Uh, let's say blogging uh, everybody was on live journal those days so i made a lot of face to face friends who were also my friends on the internet and both really helped me to get into wildlife circles and start going out for birding and nature trips so how did she get into birding specifically because isn't that a big part of the nature walk she does now yeah it started she explained with finding this group called bng birds I think BNG birds have been conducting walks now for about forty-seven years. 
it is covid which brought us stop to the box wait what did she just say 47 years i know it's quite something isn't it But yeah, BNG Birds was started in 1972 by Dr. Joseph George and two fellow birders. Those days, I don't think even JP Nagar existed at that time. I think from Jai Nagar onwards, it was Manargata Forest. So they had a lot of access. And my nature guru, Karthik, says that they would traipse all over the place. And traffic was so low that they could go from one end of the city to the other without much difficulty. And they used to correspond by postcards. Uh, setting up the next uh, sunday outing or the next monthly outing whatever it was so they have moved from postcards to phone calls to emails to e groups and then to whatsapp and now uh, the umbrella group is now on telegram we don't know where it's going next that really is some tremendous history yeah and it's really a lovely inheritance for those who joined over the years like deepa and she told me how she began by joining them on the walks they conducted in lalbagh The second Sunday walk was in Lal Park, and I live in JP Nagar, which is uh, very close by. So I started going there, and then I met a lot of people who were uh, really knowledgeable. And in Lal Park, for the first thing was of course the birds, and the second thing was the plants and the trees in that garden. Amazing collection of trees from all over the world. So my interest actually started with trees, but then I realized that the things sitting on the trees were also very interesting. and then kartik and being the expert on butterflies that he is you also got me interested in butterflies i what i would say is on these walks i would pick up little nuggets of information process it into knowledge later on put it in with other pieces of information so it's like a, a full nani of uh, flowers which each person has given me which i have put together and i am indebted to everybody for giving me those flowers so while birding was at the heart of organizing the walks learning about trees butterflies spiders snakes etc was organically an extension of this learning space so well cutting now to the present after being involved in these spaces for more than 15 years deepa has become one of the prominent members of the group who has been actually organizing walks now it is covid which brought a stop to the walks we had added to the walks by introducing the third and fourth sunday walks uh we were conducting the third sunday walk and then my friend deepak joy stick took over and then i was conducting the fourth sunday walk open walk for a fairly long time i do not recall exactly how many years but for a few years definitely in fact while bng birds took a break during the pandemic deepa decided to conduct covid careful walks on her own and uh, these were undertaken during the periods when lockdowns were eased and people could visit open green spaces in small numbers Hey but before we get into the pandemic period um tell me what is a walk with deepa like how does one get to know about it and how does she organize it so the bng birds group or the covid careful outing group both are accessible through various platforms you can join them on an email group or through telegram and deepa and other members of the group who organize and conduct these walks send updates on these groups and one can choose to join in accordingly so from deepa's side the organizing looks something like this So essentially, what I find is that uh, if you f- uh, I get information about these lakes, so lakes or forest areas where there are a lot of birds sighting, and uh, my idea is generally it's not that I need to see the birds so much as I would like everybody else to see the birds or the trees or the plants that I see. So uh, if it is a place like these lakes, let's say Kaikotra Halli Lake, which is on the Sarjapura route, it is a small lake which is fenced very safe. It's ideal place to take small children. There is a beautiful little lake called Putan Hali Lake, which uh, Usha Rajagopalan and her teammates have been working very hard for for over ten years now. It's a tiny lake. I take my toddlers to that lake because it is such a beautiful place to take young children. Very safe and very nice. There's always a volunteer on duty to help with the children also. So there are places like this. Then there are the open forests. Let's say uh, the place where I'm taking a few children tomorrow to Ragi Hali Forest. Uh, there is Ravu Gudlu. There is uh, Jaipur Dhoti. All these are still forest patches. We love Costco Tele. I would call it uh, Bangalore's top birding hotspot because you can easily in the winter you can easily get ninety plus species of birds there, and I have got those. Having done this for so many years, Deepa's knowledge of natural spaces in and around the city is really quite extensive, and I think it's also rather nice how she's putting in the thought on the needs and safety of each of the groups. So what happens once a spot is chosen? 
Well, from there on, it's getting the people together. Then I make a WhatsApp group of the people who are interested. Then we have a common meeting point, and then I have something called the MCS or the mandatory chai point. So where people stop, we all introduce ourselves, and it builds the community very well. I often find our with the groups of friends they make their own plans and they go together. And today in COVID, you cannot have very large group. So having these small groups going together is a very nice. Thing. So that's the way it works. And then when we come back on the WhatsApp group, we exchange photographs, we exchange information. Suppose I have seen a plant there and I cannot remember the name. I would come back, post the photograph, and give them the name of the plant and how it is used. So this kind of information we exchange. And again, very often those lead to, frankly, they lead to a lot of acquaintanceship, become friendships after that. I had a chance to be a part of another walk organized by Deepa to Hoskote Lake last year. And it panned out exactly like this. Uh, in fact, what I really liked was how she sent us these ethical birder guidelines beforehand, which included instructions on how to be a good birder. You mean things like wear clothes that blend in and don't make too much noise? Well, that and other simple things like keeping water, hats and snacks to make the whole event comfortable. But also more broader guidelines that centered on the promotion of the welfare of birds and the environment, even as one respects the rights of others and does minimal damage. And you know, Deepa made this point in our conversation about photography in particular. It's a double-edged sword, uh, Artika. What has happened is that what I call the democracy of photography. Now, every single person with a mobile camera has a very good camera, in, uh, the mobile phone has a very good camera in her hands. That has caused a huge interest in the surroundings. I mean, leave alone selfies. But the fact is that people have got interested in the architecture of our city. People have got interested in various, let's say, things around them. Textiles. Uh, what is our heritage? Uh, what is the, and of course, what are the forests around us? What are the trees around us? In every way, photography has brought an awareness of what can be photographed. But in the process, it's also happened that this, the social media... The liking for being liked is a very, uh, what do you call it? It's a, it's not the greatest thing in the world. Because I often come across a lot of photographers who say, I've got a brilliant shot of this bird, what is it? So the point is not the photograph. To me, it's not the photograph, but the contents of the photograph. But for many people, liking, getting likes on social media, getting to win a competition, these seem to become the focus of the photography. So that causes problems sometimes. Yeah, especially given our vast numbers. It's not as if just a few people are going and photographing that bird at its nest. Suddenly, this happened at Valley School. There was a beautiful bird with a lovely nest. And at one point of time, there were about 35 photographers crowding around the nest. So, Karnataka Forest Department closed down the area completely. Now, we are all out of a fantastic birding hotspot because of that kind of unethical behavior. So, photography is a very good tool, but like all tools... It's like a kitchen knife. You have to use it carefully. I can imagine that happening. I mean, even in the sanctuary and national park visits I've made in the last couple of years, one sees that happening, this preoccupation with photography, overcoming the concern and care for the animal and the environment. And it does sound really useful to have a ready set of guidelines so that people can understand what they're signing up for, and especially if you're a first-time birder. Yeah, and you know, Deepa also writes out these very beautiful descriptive pieces on a field visit every once in a while. And I remember from one this bit where she described the advantages of birding while it's cloudy or raining. Uh, she said, why do you think it's an advantage? Um, uh, well, it makes the bird photographer put down the camera and take up the binoculars. When one is looking through a camera, one is thinking of the image as well as the bird. But when one is peering through binoculars, one is thinking only about the bird. So this results in better observation. And and really all of these photos and observations put together at the end of the process following the walk is really quite rich, where Deepa pulls together the full list of birds seen on the walk. There is this platform or application called eBird. Uh, right. It was a recent application, but it has uh, made remarkable strides in the collection of data. And uh, it has involved all of us amateur birders as uh, data collection centers. So whenever we go birding, we can list all the birds that we've seen. And there is another app called iNaturalist, in which not only the birds, you can also enter the butterflies, this one, insects, trees, anything. And they will help you with the names and the IDs of all of them. 
and it's a very good way for you to gain knowledge and for you to add to the database so so for example post our hoskote walk people share their lists on the group which deepa then puts up on ebird you can even add in photos and number of birds of a species there and uh, voila at the end of the day you have this grand list and summary of all the birds that were spotted on the walk that's really lovely so as an amateur you're also getting a chance to see the birds named and listed and have it as something you can return to and begin your own list actually you can do a lot more but i'll let deepa explain what i liked about ebird was that it was first that it is open source it is not uh, commercial and it is open to everybody and then other things after trying several other this one of keeping bird list i found that this was one place where it was very user friendly even for a person like me i am not tech savvy so i found it very easy to use and the level of use which i wanted to put it to lay entirely with me i could use it to mine data or let's say i'm going to kanha next month i can go and find out what are the birds i'm likely to see in kanha i can look at the list and find that out so i can use it in the way i want i can share my list with my friends in the us and with my friends in europe wow that sounds really useful and as an individual who might be new to the hobby it would greatly ease this whole process of figuring things out and of course continuing down that path of exploration Yeah and plus there is the added advantage that this information then becomes part of the base knowledge which is used by scientists and researchers to study the distribution and abundance in bird populations eBird is helmed by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and in fact the information that's come together because of this platform was the primary data used to put together India's first state of India's birds 2020 So your day visit and lists also become part of a larger conservation and research story. But you know, <laughs> I mean, I have to say this, as much as it's lovely to have the aid of technology at one end, it does not equal the joy of being in the green space and learning from people like Deepa and other regular birders because they not only identify the bird for you but also tell you so many things about you know their life cycle or some local story related to it it's just so much fun i absolutely enjoyed how all sorts of questions came up in the two walks i attended from adults and especially from children believe me there are no bad questions and good questions uh, there may be bad answers but there are every question is quite valid actually In fact, why I find that people are often very inhibited about asking questions, and this is something that I would ask everybody if they can. Yeah, people are basically shy. You can't do much about it, but you should not be inhibited about asking why this, what is that. You get very interesting answers. Deepa also shared this little nugget about how to be a truly wonderful naturalist guide that she had gleaned from her guru. Uh, my nature guru kartik has told me if you do not know something say you do not know it but let that be the last time you say do not, i do not know to that particular question today you have the internet at your hands go home find out about it so i had gone to vanargatta with a group of school children and the young children they pointed out to a caterpillar which had little white globules on its back they asked me what it was and i didn't know so i said i'll find out when i went home i found out that wasp lay these eggs on the caterpillar and the caterpillar is quite literally carrying its death on its back because when the larvae hatch they will feed on that they will stun the caterpillar kill it and eat it so the mother has provided for food for the babies which she will never see so this is something that i learned because of the curiosity of these children i might not even have noticed that caterpillar yeah i frankly i enjoy meeting people and it's a very special place when you meet children because the yeah, other ones you know where you light the candle and the candle flame burns quite brightly after that actually that brings me to a question that's been at the back of my mind as you've been telling me about deepa and bng birds i mean the older members of the group and deepa have been doing this for so many years you know like she said many parts of the city were still forest areas when the group initially began so what kind of changes have they seen in the city you're right of course uh, they have seen the city change tremendously As Deepa said, Bangalore seems to have become bruhatar and bruhatar referring to the Kannada word which means bigger or greater. And according to her from the perspective of a naturalist, it's been a slide downhill. My own time, leave alone people who've been here from the 60s, they obviously would have seen a very sharp deterioration over the decades. I in the last uh, 14 years that I've been involved in these outings, 
I have certainly seen that the, the, let's say the number of species of birds in Lalbagh has come down. Lalbagh itself is becoming more of a theme park and less of a botanical garden now. So I can definitely see the degradation. I can see that we are getting less and less places to access. And the places which have become full of human habitation, the birds have disappeared to a very large extent. Yes, certainly I can see that change. And uh, my seniors, as I would call them, would certainly see a, a remark upon a much larger change for the worse. I asked Deepa if she could explain how she's experienced this in Bangalore with an example. Uh, let's say in 2007, 2008, 2009, I used to go to a forest patch called Turahalli in the south of Bangalore. We used to go to watch what are called raptors or birds of prey, which hunt other birds. Now, these birds of prey require large swatches of forest or open grassland to be present. Today, Turahalli has hardly any raptors. You get all the small, tiny birds maybe, but even those uh, the people who now live in Turahalli, there are a multitude of apartments there. They are very happy because they see some birds. Whereas we realize that what they are seeing are the remnants of the few, the few species that are left after the others have been pushed away. That doesn't surprise considering we've all experienced our cities grow more dense and concrete over the years. But still coming from a group who has been so present and watchful, it feels saddening. And what Deepa is saying is confirmed by the State of India's Birds Report too. It says that of the 867 bird species assessed by them, 52% show a clear decline over the past decades. Sadly, a trend that seems to be happening worldwide. Yeah, and we've been discussing this in our other episodes as well, you know, how we're experiencing a sixth mass species extinction event worldwide due to a complex mix of human actions. And added to the reduced green spaces and the quality of those spaces, Deepa was also worried about the fact that access to the remaining green spaces was being cut off. Uh, sometimes the reason given is construction. Sometimes the reason given is that there have been untoward incidents of drunkenness or, you know, what our Victorian prudery calls indecent behavior. I really wonder where quoting couples can go if there are no public spaces. But uh, this is given as a reason. And I personally feel that uh, the duty of the forest guards is to make it safe for people instead of uh, having a blanket ban on everything. But uh, unfortunately, that is what has been happening. Uh, Turahalli, there were a couple of forest fires in 2015 and 16. That was the reason for that being shut off. But now there is a proposal to develop it as a tree park. I am still very tickled by the idea of a tree park where, you know, you're so used to industrial parks and uh, uh, silicon parks that you have to mention that it is a tree park. I can't help but be reminded of that song by Joni Mitchell, Big Yellow Taxi, where she literally sings, they took all the trees and put them in a tree museum and they charged the people a dollar and a half to see them. Yeah, well, Joni sure knew what was coming. At a time when we need more people to engage with the environment, we find our green spaces cut off. You know, I'm curious though, How does Deepa connect with what, you know, she sees happening in the world around her? And why is it important to her that urban dwellers connect with nature? Yeah, that's a question I did ask her why she thought it was important for people to reclaim their relationship with the natural world. So I think that uh, in the past, uh, maybe 100, 200, 300 years, we come from a history of clearing the jungles to make our human habitation. So in those days, any predator, uh, a bear, a tiger, uh, you know, a snake would be something to be afraid of because it could attack you, it could attack your children. So it was something to be avoided at all costs. So jungles were cleared to make human habitation. That uh, situation continued and it was also a great thing for uh, people to hunt, let's say, the tigers or the leopards. You know that the cheetah was made extinct in India. Uh, I think the last cheetah died in 1947. And uh, I have still seen the places where they have a huge list of the number of tigers killed by so and so Maharaja. So we call it now the wall of shame. But at that point of time, it was the done thing to rid the jungles of what they considered dangers to humanity. So now we unfortunately continue with that feeling to a point where we have sterilized our habitation completely. You are considered a good homemaker if you do not have a single ant in your home. You, you do not have any beehive outside your house. 
leave alone the any other major things you do not want any animals around you you do not want any insects around you that is considered good housekeeping so now we are realizing that that is not a tenable thing we are upsetting the balance of nature and so i definitely it is important that we accept nature once again we realize that we are a part of nature and we should accept all that is in nature maybe not in our immediate surroundings but at least keep our forest patches and for our urban green patches uh, and protect them Deepa added how over the years she's seen a whole variety of people join her for the walks and how they pan out over time. Let's say I take 20 people on out, out on a walk. There may be a few people for whom that will be it they may not be interested. But there will be some who realize that yes we are part of a larger scenario let us look at this. And if this is what has been sustaining us let us see what we can do. So it is a long journey from interest to conservation. But yes unless you take that first step you are not going to climb the stairs i like that what you don't engage with you cannot protect so yeah i can see how these walks would be a lovely first step to take to begin and again to learn and love the world around us indeed and you know during the long period of the pandemic and lockdown restrictions on social gatherings and movement people became more interested in pursuits like birding uh, the hoskote lake walk i went for had probably 40 or more individuals who turned up at 6:30 in the morning our bodies seem to somehow instinctively understand what researchers are confirming now activities which involve being in nature like birding is good for people's well-being and i remember coming across one really specific bit of research which said that bird song has been shown to contribute towards attention restoration and stress recovery Exactly. It's it's odd sometimes that we need science to tell us what is so instinctively evident. Uh still I don't think that includes all of us cuz you know as we were chatting Deepa shared how she's had these lovely moments when someone has walked up to her and declared how the walks with her inspired them to their own deeper engagement with the world around. I was walking down in the Munirnagar area and suddenly somebody came and said hi to me. and this was uh, sanjeev kulkarni uh, who, who runs prani which is a animal sanctuary then he said i have attended all the walks in lalbagh and you are the person who has made me so interested in wildlife this is why i am doing what i am doing today so i don't know whether he was praising me or praising me but yes i was i personally felt very happy that i had been able to set somebody on this path so prani is a pet sanctuary of rescued animals which is on the outskirts of bangalore and another truly sweet place for children and adults to go hang out with feed and learn more about different animals and i'm pretty sure sanjeev is just one of the many who've been inspired by these lovely walks yeah it's like she's received this beautiful legacy and knowledge and she's passing it on now to the next generation yeah and and you know you meet deepa and there is such an energy about her but her work as she outlines also has this coming to terms with so much loss and degradation of all that she loves so i had to ask her what keeps her motivated and what gives her hope for our cities i'm not sure that i'm always very hopeful there are times when i could tear my hair out uh like just now for example uh what has happened is that the grasslands of hesargatta the supreme court has just said that it is going to be developed you know you have this development in in inverted commons which is completely human centric they might put, put up a film city over there what is a prime habitat deepa is referring to the hesargatta grasslands possibly that last patch of grasslands within the city of bengaluru it has come under the threat of being developed as deepa says into a film city several times over the last few years you know very often what looks like a to a real estate developer what looks like wasteland it is not wasteland at all it is a thriving ecosystem of living beings all of whom help to keep us living and surviving and thriving so i feel that the sooner we realize it the better so i don't always find that uh, our government or our leaders are very much for it they don't see the long term but uh, i still feel that there are enough of us who are aware of it and who are fighting hard enough yes the setbacks are many but Uh, in the last few years i find that a lot of our youngsters are getting more and more involved with the space so yes that gives me a lot of optimism and you know the reason spaces like hesargatta continue to survive is because people have fought for them 
and people have fought for them because they have through birding or other such hobbies engaged with those spaces and realized how rich and valuable they are so tell me um considering the kinds of stresses and changes that deepa has seen through the last decade and more what does she make of our current cities well for one she expressed her concern over the reducing green cover and this kind of cutting down for trees for uh, more traffic to flow through it's a double whammy you are cutting down a source of oxygen and you are introducing something that is going to provide more and more carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide it's a double poison so i hope our government sees the futility of this wider roads leads to more traffic it doesn't do anything else and so of course i had to ask her then how she would do things differently what if she had a chance to design the city what would be her priority i would uh, go back to mahatma gandhi's dream in a certain way she said india lives in her villages i would develop the villages so that our population could be evenly spread across and not have this agglomeration of urban uh, uh, points you know where the resources are strained a lot and then the concretization takes place so i would do that and in our cities i would first of all essentially i would have trees on every inch one i would have parks everywhere see after lal bagh after this one kaban park we don't really have a major park in bangalore for the last 130 years we have nothing so uh, something where this is developed along with the human habitation is what i would think of yeah i would call pedestrians very estate pedestrians and cyclists and i do not know what is in the future who knows maybe in the next 30 years we we'll suddenly discover some method of uh, transportation which doesn't depend on fossil fuels it that might happen so who knows maybe i can transfer myself by thought to you if that happens that would be great they seem like such easy asks considering the growing shadow of the climate crisis on our cities and yet somehow we seem to be headed in completely the opposite direction It does seem like that, doesn't it? I mean, I keep wondering how knowing all this Deepa is so motivated to continue doing what she does. But I realize through our conversation that at the heart of how she's able to do so much and be such an effective educator is that her interest is centered around the love for the world. Well, basically I enjoy it. It's as simple as that. I love going in fact people thank me for taking them out it's actually the other way around i'm so grateful to them that they come and pick me up and drop me back and they take me into the places where i love to go and i get to meet so many interesting people i see so many children who are interested i think it's basically that that is and the they, they, i am not full of uh, all the time full of noble thoughts about conservation <laughs> basically enjoy what i do It feels fitting I think to end with this Aldo Leopold quote I was reminded of like winds and sunsets wild things were taken for granted until progress began to do away with them now we face the question whether a still higher standard of living is worth its cost in things natural wild and free for us the minority the opportunity to see geese is more important than television The question on what we choose for our cities and how we choose remains open. If this conversation on birding has resonated with you and you'd like to join the walks Deepa organizes, write to us and we'll get you in touch. Also, do listen into our extra with Deepa where we run through a quick FAQ with her on how to begin birding, the books, the equipment, etc. We cover it all. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast for more episodes. You can follow us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts or a podcast app of your convenience. We're also on YouTube, so look up the channel The Curiosity Collective or follow us through our social media pages. And most importantly, if you like what you're hearing, please do share these episodes with your family, friends and community members. Leave us your thoughts, comments and feedback. We love hearing from you. TCC is a not-for-profit initiative that is funded by you the listeners. If you'd like to support the work that we do at TCC, there are different ways that are listed on the support and contribute page of our website www.thecuriositycollective.org. You can also write to us at team@thecuriositycollective.org or message us on 6300711451. if you feel called to make a contribution to sponsor an episode or a podcast series 
This could help us with our research, writing, admin and editing costs to build further resources that speak to our collective well-being. We hope you'll join us on this journey of co-creating the space to nurture and build cities that are healthy and happy. This podcast was created by Sriniti Raghavan, Deepika Khatri and Arpita Joshi. The sound editing was by Vijay Chavla.